our workshop Interreligious Peace Building in Nigeria. I have the great honor to moderate this workshop. My name is Magdalena Zimmermann. I'm working for Mission 21 as head of education, exchange, and research. As Mission 21, we understand ourselves as international learning community and engaged in international development cooperation. Peace building is a key issue of our work and we are focused on interreligious peace, peace building. Often religions get misused. We can see conflicts where religion is there to justify the conflicts. We are aware of this, but we are also aware of the potential for peace in every religion. And therefore, if we are talking about peace work, we talk about interreligious peace work because we want doing peace building together also with other religion. It's a pleasure that we have today, this evening here with us Dr. Jakubu Joseph. He is the coordination, coordinator for Nigeria, for Nigeria for Mission 21. And he has a lot of experiences and knowledge about the topic of interreligious peace building. He will share with us his experiences and on the end of the workshop you will also have the possibility to raise up your questions. Now, dear Joseph, welcome and Thank the you floor very much. is yours. Thank you very much. I'm happy to be here today and to, to meet you and share with you uh, some of our experience. Um, as Magdalene Zimmerman said, Mission 21 is a global learning organization. And so what I'm sharing mostly is what we have learned in the course of our work. And when we talk about the work that we do as Mission 21, we are simply talking about the work that our partners are doing. Their work is our work. They are the ones doing the work. Actually, they are the ones doing the work. And so, in my role as the country coordinator of Nigeria, um, I interface with different partners. And peace building has become a very important component of our work. And over the years, peace building has changed in dimensions. It has not remained what it used to be before. And this is what I'm going to be bringing to you this evening. Um, I'm going to be talking about the bridge building work that we are doing. But when we talk about bridge, they, what will come to your mind is something like a river that serves as a barrier between one end to the other. You need a bridge to connect these two, these bar uh, these two ends. And so peace building serves as bridge building in divided communities in the context of Muslim-Christian conflict that we have found ourselves. Our peace building effort has geared towards building bridges of understanding, accommodation, and mutual solidarity. Now, I want to take an example of the peace building work that Mission 21 has been involved in, in Jos, Nigeria. Jos is in central Nigeria. But before I do that, I would like to give you a little background information. Because things are changing rapidly in Nigeria. 
such even the numbers if you are looking at the the population count the numbers are changing the population of nigeria is changing quite fast the present at, at september middle of september uh, uh, august i mean the population of nigeria is 218 million nigeria was having a population of 32 million in 1950 and in 2000 our population was 124 million in 1950 our population will be 401 million. And by 2100, the population of Nigeria will be 733 million. Within a span of 150 years, the population of Nigeria has changed, has, has increased 23 times. Whereas the global population has increased within a span of 150 years only by 4.4 times. These numbers are very important for the fact that the population of Nigeria is quite young. The median age is 18 years. If you look at the population pyramid, those within between the age of 18 and 25 make up 54 percent of the population 18 and 25 these numbers have implications for peace and security 53 percent of nigeria's population live in urban areas in recent past 70 percent of nigeria's population a working population rather, rather, is employed in the agricultural sector. Today, we see phenomenal rural urban migration. And in the cities, the jobs are not there. And so you have more and more young people frustrated in the cities. 32% of Nigeria's population lives in extreme poverty. In absolute numbers, we are talking about 69.9 million, about 70 million Nigerians live in extreme poverty. As high as 70% live in poverty. 32% in extreme poverty. The country has a total land mass of about 923,000 square kilometers. With the population you see that is exploding, rapidly exploding. The amount of arable land, which the land that can be cultivated for food, is reducing as a result of climate change and environmental degradation. So as environmental insecurity increases, community fragility and conflict is also on the rise. You will hear of conflict between farmers and herders because of scarcity of natural resources. Nigeria, to be sure, is the 11th largest oil producer in the world, which Oil accounts for 90% of the GDP, 90% uh, of the total export value. Unfortunately, this has not translated into meaningful human development because of official corruption, because of misuse of the country's resources. And that is why Nigeria remains at the bottom of the Human Development Index. Nigeria is a federal state with 36 states and a federal capital territory. I have a map here, but it's not possible to project. I'm sure some of you have seen the map of Nigeria. The 36 states and the federal capital territory make up the federating units. Despite adopting a federal 
formula. Nigeria has remained a highly divided state. Where you find that the over 250 ethnic groups that live together are in, from time to time, constant tension. Christians and Muslims make up the majority, claiming 45% each and 10% African traditional religions. Even these numbers are contestable. Now, once upon a time, we were living together in harmony. We lived as neighbors, as friends, as playmates, as colleagues. As there was religious accommodation. There was inter-ethnic, good inter-ethnic relations. Of course, there were ethnic strifes that happened from time to time, as you know, Conflict is part of human social existence. But by and large, the ethnic groups had coexisted together. There were intermarriages. Christians and Muslims married each other, and different ethnic groups also married each other. We celebrated our differences. During Christmas, it was, Christmas used to be a national event where Muslims and Christians will come together and celebrate. We go to the Amir's palace as a child growing up. I will, in the 70s and 80s, we'll go to the Amir's palace, who is a, usually a Muslim. And we will sing gospel songs. We will pray. We will preach. The Amir will come and address us. And during the Muslim festival, we also come together to celebrate. We eat the meals together. But... Later on, cracks begin to set in. After our return to democratic rule in 1999, identity politics began to tear us apart. Poverty also increased because the ruling class continued to impoverish the population. The deplorable state of infrastructure and social amenities in the country is known to any that I know in the world. Some of the infrastructure that we use today were meant for our population when it was at independence 48,900,000. And this was, those infrastructure had certain utilization capacity that they were installed with. You know, after some years, your car will not have the same capacity. But here we have a situation whereby the infrastructure, which has lower capacity at the moment, is meant to cater for a population that is three, four times what it was even originally designed to cater for. So electricity, sh uh, load shedding, sometimes you get a few hours of electricity, the roads are not there. Uh, the uh, schools, the hospitals are not working. So this itself has created a serious pressure on the population. People are marginalized. People are discriminated. And with the large youth population that we have, unemployment among young people is very alarming. We have also erosion of moral values. Growing up as a child in the 70s, we were always taught to care for the stranger, respect others. But today, this has changed. In fact, with the rise of Pentecostalism, many young people even believe within the church they have to make money quick. Yes. And so, you have to show that you are prospering because prosperity was equated with spiritual growth. And so a lot of people through the values of hard work, of patience, all those virtues were thrown away, even within the church. 
and as a society, people began to worship money. Relationship was not with the stranger was not considered as important as material things that you can get in the course of your interaction with another. Climate change and environmental insecurity have continued to become a challenge to Nigeria. As you may know, Nigeria is one of the frontline states with regards to desertification and climate change. Desert encroachment is coming closer and closer from the northeastern part of the country and northwestern part of the country, where you find that water table is becoming more and more depleted. And so it's difficult for you to get water. Many communities are struggling to get even drinking water. And green pastures that you need for the animals are becoming extremely scarce. Religious radicalization has also increased. This has also created the crack that is pulling us, dividing us. And some of these radicalization agenda are being imported from outside the country. That people are coming, especially Islamic radicalization, we have seen that increase since September 11, 2001. Partly as a reaction to the American invasion of Afghanistan. Many groups have sprung up that are sympathetic uh, to the causes of those who are there resisting what they considered as American occupation. We have seen also on the Christian side many hardliners who have developed radicalized uh, theology as Christians. Um, to justify their violent dispositions. Gender injustice has been in the increase. We have seen that because of conflict that we have had over and over, which is a manifestation of masculinity. Women have been at the receiving end. In many of the conflicts, women are, and girls are abducted, subjected to sexual slavery and many of them are left to bear the brunt of conflict, even years after the conflict has ended. Social inequality, social discontent have all been in the increase, and what I characterize as a broken promise is one of the major bane of the Nigerian society. A, what I mean by a broken promise is, when we were growing up, we were told if you go to school and work hard and you have the right attitude, there is no limit. You will succeed. And then coming out of school, the jobs are not there. The few jobs that are there, the elite will take it for their own children. And so the children of the poor, even when they come out of school with good grades, have nothing. They have no job. Because recruitment into the public service is always done are uh, in the night by the ruling class. The senators, the governors, the ministers, and government officials will recruit their own children to the detriment of other children who have no so-called connection. This has deepened, or rather widened, social distance among our people. We have seen violence-induced segregation where Muslims and Christians have moved on, moved to live in their own enclaves. And so we have discursive construction of mental maps, theirs and ours, us versus them. If you come to a city in northern Nigeria, you will always ask, where is our own side of the city? Where can I rent a house? Because of the conflict, our cities have become segregated. You, an outsider may not see it, but there, is, there are parts of the city that are considered no-go areas, and you cannot venture to go into those no-go areas because of your religious identity. We have also seen something that is increasing the social distance. That is the ambivalent potential of social media. Social media can be a glue or a solvent. And we have seen increasingly 
that social media has become a tool that enables divisiveness. People are spreading fake news and hate messages. On WhatsApp, you, when you wake up, you receive message that attributes a certain plan for attack on the other group and tells you to prepare. Most times, these are not true. And we, are, we find that young people are caught in a crossfire. And I refer to this group or generation of young people, the alpha generation, those born from early 2010s to mid 2020s, and the generation Z, born from 1997 to 2012, as well as the millennials, born in 1981 to 1996. Even my generation, Generation X, those of us born at the early stage of Generation X, we have not escaped this trap. Social media. So people, young people, begin, they are used to promote this divisiveness, this social distance, and to promote hate. Now, what has conventional interfaith peace building done? It is often top down. It focuses on religious leaders who have high visibility. And the deliverables are often handshake or communique, joint communique that will come out. Women and youth are relegated to the background. Because if you look at the number of religious leaders we have in this assembly, women are few. So in even this kind of interfaith peace building uh, forum, often women and youth are relegated. They are not, they are underrepresented. There is less emphasis on everyday life and more emphasis on a one-off event. And you find that such meetings also enjoy government support. In Nigeria, the government will even send brown envelope. Those who understand that, you know what I mean. Brown envelope meaning the government will send some money and say to these high-level pastors and imams, this is for your transport. So it's money that will go to them. They take place in comfortable environments that are so removed from reality, and attention is often on personalities. Is the sultan coming? Is the archbishop coming? Is the cardinal coming? So such events are centered, revolve around these personalities. Vulnerable leadership is hardly encouraged. And therefore, even though the leaders are traumatized, either because of their own direct trauma or vicarious traumatization, they suppress it because as a man, you shouldn't show that you have trauma. So when they speak, the trauma is influencing it, but they mark it. They also need help. Now, youth in peace building. What we have found our experience as Mission 21 is that youths are key stakeholders. We recognize that they are traumatized and they are seeking answers. And this takes me to the work of a historian called Hansen Marcus, who did research in the 1950s and came up with what he described as the phenomenon of third generation return. According to the phenomenon of third generation return, the questions that the first and second generation are too eager to forget, the, first gen the third generation wants to ask. The third generation wants to ask and get answers to questions that the first and second generation wants to sweep under the carpet. So we have, to, we have come to recognize that these young people who have lost their parents will one day want to know, how did my father die? I am above 50, but even after being, even being above 50, there are times I weep when I remember my father was killed in the Nigerian Civil War more than 50 years ago. And therefore, the child today that is a victim of this violence that we're experiencing will ask question, why did I end up as a tout in a motor park without education? Why did I end up poor? Why did I end up like this? The child will want to know. And therefore, we must give attention to that. 
And these young people carried with them shattered dreams. They have dreams, and these dreams are shattered. I have also discovered in the work we do with Mission 21 that the young people that are often left out in traditional conventional peace building, they are rejected but they are relied on. Many of them are the gatekeepers and vigilantes in their own communities. When I met some of the young people in the jungle where they are engaged in drug addiction, they told me that the church has that attitude of seeing that treating them like outcasts. When they come to church, the church, the ushers, the pastors, and the members despise these young people because they see them as not holy enough to be in the church. But when there is conflict and there is a need to defend the church, they reach out to these young people that are engaged in drug addiction to come and surround the church and defend it. We often think that young people are influenced but we forget also they are influencers. Peer influence is very powerful. So if they have positive influence, they can also influence their, their peers. We have discovered through our work as Mission 21 also that the jungle has matured. I was even in the jungle three weeks ago. The jungle has matured. Young people without perspective, young people without hope, the only thing that they have is the drugs that they have. And they engage in criminal activities just to survive. Our society will see no peace unless these jungles have peace. If we want to see peace, we must take peace to the jungle. We can't have peace if the jungle has no peace. And our young people are in the jungle. They are not in the meeting hall where we have tea and coffee and high-visibility leaders are talking for the camera. These young people have real needs, and we better go to meet those needs. So we need a paradigm shift, and this is what we have discovered in the work that we do in Mission 21 with our partners. A paradigm shift, shift from countering narratives to creating alternative narratives. When when this issue of religious radicalization grew, many people thought the way out is to counter narratives. And so have religious leaders, scholars, theologians who are vast to come up with arguments to debunk those teachings that brainwash the young people. Unfortunately, that failed because if you neutralize the negative and you have nothing in place, nothing to replace the negative stuff, what happens? So now, the paradigm shift that we have embraced is creating alternative narratives, and we don't create it for the young people. The young people have a right of self-determination in charting the course of their lives. So when we talk about the work of Mission 21, where, as I said earlier, we mean the work that is actually done by our local partners. The, our partner church in Nigeria, the EYN Church of the Brethren, the Lifeline Compassionate Global Initiative, and the Peace Training Center. These are our partners. So what, what do we do? Mission 21 is like a pollinator. We share resources, the funding that is given with the support of churches from Switzerland and Germany, is given to the partners who design their programs, their projects, and they carry out activities. We also serve as pollinators to also support them in capacity building, looking around to match with capacity building opportunities within their local context and even outside. We took some of them to Rwanda to learn, for example, about Alternative to Violence Project, to learn about uh, HEROC, that is Trauma Healing Approach, and Turning the Tides. And these are some, even dealing with the past through the Swiss Peace, some of the work that the Swiss Peace has done in East Timor about dealing with the past. We have also shared that experience with our partners. So our role is to share the resources, as well as also share any opportunity for capacity building. 
Now, as I said, countering the narrative just leaves a vacuum. And so creating alternative narratives fills in something, puts in something fresh and something new in the young person. We also adopt an integrated approach whereby we, all, we don't just talk. It's not just about dialogue. So we combine dialogue and diapraxis. As a matter of fact, dialogue is the minor. Diapraxis is about recognizing that we are humans and we have needs. And because we recognize that we have human needs, even conflict parties recognize the right of each other to meet their needs. And so we can, people in conflict can work together. We can address some of the concrete things that have to do with survival. And as young people are brought together to engage in concrete activities, they, become, they begin to appreciate their common humanity. They begin to appreciate the need also to embrace diversity and to accord each other respect. We also use a holistic approach which involves psychosocial support, life skills, and vocational training. So peace building has assumed multiple dimensions, not just talking, but also walking the talk. So we have psychosocial support because the young people are coming from broken backgrounds. So they need the effect of trauma can be devastating. And trauma can inhibit any progress in someone's life if you don't address it. Life skills, talking about how to live with the religious other, accommodation, social cohesion, being a responsible young person, respecting and caring for the elderly, gender equality. These are all subjects that we discuss under life skills because they equip the young person with social competences to be able to, be, to live as a responsible member of the society. In addition, one of the fundamental, one of the hearts of Mission 21's peace building work is to make sure that young people have opportunity to acquire vocational skills, to get, to become productive economically. Because many of them have left school and they have no opportunity. So many of them have not even had the opportunity to go to school. So with vocational training, the emphasis is on getting young people to identify their, work, their areas of interest, welding, carpentry, pastry, fashion design, makeup art, to name it. And then they are enrolled in apprenticeship training. And now Mission 21 also helps to uh, work with our partners to establish centers, vocational training centers, especially for young women, to provide safe space for them where they can come and acquire skills and receive psychosocial support and to bond with one another receiving mutual solidarity because they are united by common suffering or common experience. So that is what we focus on. And as they come to learn skills, as they receive life skills education, and life skills education is important because what the life skills education is emphasizing is what our conventional educational system is not doing. UNESCO has adopted four pillars, the DELOS four pillars of education. They are learning to know, learning to do, learning to be, and learning to live with others. So peace building is the fourth pillar of UNESCO DELOS four pillar of education. Learning to live with others, developing the, that competence. But it is also at the same time talking about the other pillars, learning to do. So education is not about head knowledge, but it's also about what? Applying knowledge to solve, to solve, solve practical problems. So people must acquire skills to be able to have means of livelihood. And learning to be, if you are educated, the way you treat someone, the way you treat your sister, the way you treat your wife, the way you treat your partner, you treat women, the way you treat the old, the young, will all be reflected in you if you are educated. 
So these are the kind, this is the way that the young people are prepared when they go through this training. We celebrate little progress because it's not easy to withdraw from smoking Indian hemp. Withdrawal syndrome can hit a young person hard. And so when they change a little, we celebrate, we give them a pat on the back and say, you are doing good. And then we also try to forge intergenerational solidarity. So of course I've touched on conventional peace building where the focus has been on religious leaders, but we don't leave the religious leaders outside of this. The religious leaders are involved. They are also involved in selecting those who are going to be part of the project so that the criteria is followed strictly. Those who need the opportunity get the opportunity. The religious leaders also come to speak at these vocational centers, speak to the young people, inspire them and encourage them so that they can have hope. We are also connecting and building relationships among youth from segregated neighborhoods through promoting interface activities so that they can have Christmas celebration together. They can attend a Christian wedding together or a Muslim wedding together. These are part of the activities. We also adopt a result-based approach, a result-based management approach. What we mean by that is oftentimes projects are carried out for the sake of carrying out an activity. But a project, but a result-based management approach is done in such a way that you start with the end in mind. So what is the end? The end is we want lives to be transformed. The end is that we want these young people to have opportunities in life. The end is that we want our communities to be peaceful. So every single step we do, we take, we want to measure how close are we to our destination. We measure that progress. We don't lose sight of our destination because we want to get to that destination. And then we are learning from the youths. And that's why I was excited when uh, Magdalena Zimmerman said, Mission 2020 is a global learning organization. Every time I go to the jungle or I meet these young people, I learn so much about their stories that humbles me. Sometimes I weep, I, I weep because of how I'm moved by their stories. Very powerful stories that we can learn so much from. The magic of belonging and productivity is something I would like to tell you. If you're interested in youth peace building, you will get out by the magic of belonging and productivity. Many young people that are wayward, that are easily manipulated, instrumentalized, and deployed to perpetrate acts of violence are those that are on the margin and have lost sense of connection with their families, lost sense of connection with their church, lost sense of connection with their communities, lost sense of connection. That sense of belonging, once it is restored, you will see that self-confidence is coming to the young person. A sense of self-esteem, a sense of dignity is coming to the young person. And even the magic of having something to do. Some of the young people pride themselves that after going through the program, because once you go through the vocational training, upon graduation, Mission 21 makes rate available to you resources that will help you to start off a business. And I am personally involved to make sure that our, the beneficiaries get the best. You don't go to the market and just buy anything. You must buy and give them the best so that they can have a head start. And we have seen those of them who have gone ahead to start their own vocational trades, they are also training other people. One young lady that I have met who is into makeup art has told me that she has trained 20 other girls. And she's a Muslim, she said, she has trained many Christian girls as well. And so you can see the difference it makes, the perspective about, the, about life, that this young person has because he has a job, he has something he's doing that brings uh, income to him, and because he feels now he's connected, he's part of the community, it is amazing what that can do, sense of belonging and productivity. 
the multiplier effects can be huge. We do our project and we know we are struggling. The budget is small. But even though it's small, you can do much with it. And so we are always excited to see that with the little that we're able to do, we are seeing the multiplier effect. And these multiplier effects are coming from people who can tell us, young mother, who can tell us that through the training that she went through, today she can send her children to school. A widow who can say that she's able to pay her rent because she's doing tailoring. The Muslim girl that I met recently who told me that she didn't have to take her clothes to a tailor during the Muslim festival. She sewed it herself and even sold clothes for those who cannot afford. These are stories that move me. And so I want to end by saying that the paradigm shift that I'm talking about for us came from our experience of in being engaged in the two models, working top down with religious leaders and then seeing that we can work with young people and those young people that we work with have become pathfinders in their communities with technology in their hands. They are not waiting for some religious leaders, an imam or a pastor, to even radicalize them. They have the information. They are spreading hate. They are spreading fake news. They are coming out. They want to fight. And therefore, when we engage the young people in peace building training, and training them, what we have discovered is that they become pathfinders for peace. They become the entry point for us in those communities. And in one of those communities that we are working in Jos, for those of you who know Jos close to TCNN, only a road separates the Christian community from the Muslim community. They killed each other. They destroyed, they burned each other's houses. They don't see eye to eye. Today, the, the community is coming back and is not from the, because of what, of what the leaders have done. The young people, we send them, we sponsor the Mission 21, sponsor them to attend the peace training center. And the Muslim leader, young, young person, and the Christian young person had to share a room for one month. Yes. And the Christian said to the Muslim, here is your space, pray. And he, every day he was cleaning it for the Muslim. The Muslim also said, please keep your Bible here so that my friends will not even touch it. When they went back to their communities, often because the young people, the Christian youth would want to cross over and still in the Muslim side, the Muslim youth would want to cross over and still in the Christian side, and then the community will come and the Christians will say, please don't beat our teeth. Because he is our thief, show him mercy. The Muslim will say to the Christians, don't beat our thief. Because he is our thief, show him mercy. And so they were, the people were willing to come out and fight. Because each one feels like the thief that comes to the other side should be lynched. But their own thief should be shown mercy. Today, what these young people do, if there is any news that somebody has been caught stealing, they will be invited and the Christian leader will call the Muslim youth counterpart and say, please, come and take your teeth and try to discipline him. And the Muslim will call the Christian leader and say, take, come and take your teeth and try to discipline him. When there is fake news, because they have been trained in early warning, they will call each other and say, can I verify, is it true that you Christians are coming tonight to attack us? And then the Christian leader will say, this is fake news. They will go around and tell the people that this is fake news. And they are making a difference in that community. This is what I want to share with you this evening to say that youth, youth interfaith peace building based on the paradigm shift that focuses on creating alternative narratives has really made a difference and continues to make a difference. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Yukubu, for this excellent presentation, the introductions.
and also the encouraging telling of the story, stories of hope, pathfinders for peace. Thank you so much. Maybe there are some questions or comments from your side, please feel free. Uh, my name is um, Evangelist Bariture Inuba. I come from Ogoni in Nigeria, in River State precisely. I, I want to be grateful for your analysis. It is a comprehensive analysis of the identity and experience in Nigeria. But um, I want to just make this comment. All of these Saudi stories you've said, you've told, does not capture the condition of Ogoni people. And um, Mission 21's interventionist approach has not gotten down to Ogoni people. Ogoni is suffering even more than every experience you may have gotten in the north. Ogoni is the bad place of Kensaru where that was hanged alongside eight others on November 10, 1995 for his agitation for social justice. I have a video of the kind of houses, mud houses, that could not stand the test of time. After here, if you have your WhatsApp, you give it to me. I'm going to share it for everybody. Ogoni is in an area of 104 square miles, having about 200 oil wells of more than average capacity. We have a plant of capacity 624 megawatts in our community, but we don't have light. The federal government have decided to give us the worst brunt, the worst brunt of dehumanization, just because we, were, we are eye-opener to the oppression in the Niger Delta. Ogoni women have lost means of livelihood. I'm a child protection officer. Thank God for Mission 21. I am the director of project and program Luther Welfare for Children at Risk Development Center, where we take care of orphans and vulnerable children. They are on the increase in Ogoni because it is a crisis-prone area. As we speak, there is heavy military presence to recommence operation, oil operation in Ogoni. We all know Shea was declared a personal non grata in 1993. And since that time, because of the activities in Ogoni, they were kept, kept at bay from the community. But right now, they have paid off the leaders and have come back, not fulfilling, not implementing the recommendations of UNEB report. All of us can browse UNEB report. It is the report of the United Nations Environment Program. They did, they came to Ogoni and did an environmental impact assessment and all of the recommendations, in fact, in the recommendation, it is said that if alternative water is not provided, everybody on Ogoni will be dead of benzene. We are drinking water that is contaminated with carcinogen. And so what you have experienced, what you have explained, is far less than what Ogoni is passing through. I came to this place representing the Ogoni Indigenous Ministers Forum with a tattered bag. My bag was torn into pieces in the airport. I came here without a laptop. Even the video I came with, I couldn't play it in the pre-assembly. I was, I'm a facilitator at the Indigenous People's Network, and uh, my, the video I came with could not play. That was the organization I represent could not give me a dime when I'm coming to this place. My coming to this place is purely the humanitarian service of the WCC. So I am the only Ogoni man on this whole camp. And that is why wherever I go, I have to say it. Ogoni is just one inch from being exterminated from the surface of the earth. If anyone doubts what I want to say or what I'm saying, I will furnish you with the whole video recently to summarize. Because the, the mud houses could not stand the test of time because of the climatic conditions. We, we have what we call artisanal refining around the coastline borders of Ogoni. So the discharge of soot was over 200%. And people can no longer use the rainwater. What we see is that due to biotic and abiotic factors of environmental pollution, even the mud houses could not stand the test of time. So we decided to embark on what we call uh, eco, we are doing the first eco library using plastic. So we put the sand, the mud in plastic and compact it, use the plastic to lay as a building, as an approach to the plastic environment as at the same time provide alternative shelter. All of the video is with me. So I will be grateful if good minded persons here can consider the Ogoni case. 
anywhere I go, I say it. I am only here just by the grace of God to let the world know that Ogoni is dying. We are the richest. In fact, Ogoni has the most potential oil block worth more than $550 billion in Africa as we speak. But yet, the poorest in Nigeria. We, since 1967, when River State was created, an Ogoni man has not become a, river, a governor. An Ogoni man has not become a, a deputy governor. An Ogoni man has not become a chief judge. Yet, we are the most educated. So we are suffering so much. Thank you so much. Other questions, comments, please? Um, I have a question to the both of you. First of all, I want to thank you, uh, Dr. Joseph, for your very lively and uh, uh, encouraging presentation. Even though the computer system was not on our side, I didn't miss a single slide because I could just see it <laughs> from the way you explained. Thank you very much for that. Well, my question comes back to the beginning of the presentation. Uh, Reverend Zimmerman, you said that Mission 21 is also is not only engaged in international development cooperation, but is also an international learning community. So my question to the, maybe to the both of you is, in terms of the international learning community, what do you think that we in Switzerland or in Germany or in Europe might be able to learn from the experience in Nigeria? Uh, thank you very much. Before I comment, I would like to thank you, brother, for uh, your intervention. And I, I feel your pain, and I understand what you're talking about. Uh, there are many problems, and today uh, what we are focusing on is to talk about um, the work that Mission 21 is uh, supporting in Nigeria. But that is not to say that we are addressing uh, the most serious problem. There, there are other problems as well. Um, so we are guided by strategy, by history. Mission 21 has been involved in the northeastern part of Nigeria since 1959. And yes, some of the support we give extend to Edo State because there are IDPs of at least 4,000 young people that are staying in Edo State. So through the support we, uh, the, we give to the Disaster Relief Management arm of the EYN Church, they also extend it to the Edo State. And we have been hearing also the need for us to extend our work to the southern part of the country, but the resources we have, uh, we have to use strategy to say this is where we can make the most impact. And also there are other uh, development partners, ecumenical partners that are working in different regions of the country. And I'm sure that your call uh, will also reach uh, some of these uh, actors. And I, I pray uh, that uh, the peace will come to Ogoni land because that will invariably means peace to Nigeria. So I, I appreciate uh, your openness. Um, yes, thank you for your affirmation and we are indeed um, a learning organization and we have learned uh, working uh, in Nigeria one of the things that I have found amazing is the degree to which people are resilient the resilience of people especially women especially women I have spent time working in IDP camps where most times I break down. I break down because I can't take it. But the people that we support have unshakable abiding faith in the Lord. And feel that even in their darkest moment the Lord was with them. And they believe that 
what had happened to them can only reinforce their commitment to God than pull them away from him. Some of the women that were part of a vocational training program in Shuari camp in my degree is one of the IDP camps that Mission 21 through the EYN church is supporting. They said they have learned these skills, tailoring, knitting, so that they will be able to raise money to send their daughters to school. Because Boko Haram had tried to kill education in that region. Oh, about 200 of the Chibok school girls were from the church, from the Iwa and church. And these women are saying, we will not allow Boko Haram to succeed. They didn't go to school but their children must go to school, especially their daughters must go to school. This kind of resilience that defiles the kind of evil that they experience is something that I could not fathom. And this has encouraged me over and over Anytime I go to them, I am the one that is strengthened. And I tell you, even if you are a pastor, you go there, they will be the ones to preach to you by their life. And so the lesson for me is that human resilience has that tensile strength that no metal, no metal possesses. What happened to them would have broken them into pieces ten times, but they are strong, they are firm, and they remain resolute. Thank you. Thank you so much. I think resilience resil is, is something we can really learn from the people from in other countries. I was thinking on this during the COVID pandemic, uh, our behaviors and their behavior. And I think what, what Jakubu was telling us, for example, about peace camps for young people. In Switzerland, we are also living in an intercultural, interreligious society. And what you experienced with these youth camps and living together for example, a real Swiss person living in Switzerland since centuries, maybe to share a room a month with a, with a refugee from Syria, as you mentioned before. Maybe this would also be a good learning experience for our churches, for our societies. So, Thank you so much, Jakubu. We can learn a lot about it. I'm sorry that we have to finish here sharp a quarter to eight because there will be afterwards a reception in this hall and they have to prepare. Thank you for coming. And if you want more about information about Nigeria, about what's going on there, please check our website and you will find uh, lot, lots of information. Thank you so much for your coming. Thank you.